Hey, I'm Yakov, and you're watching The Swift Bird. In the first video of 2024, let's talk about the future. This year is an important one for Swift, because it marks the 10th anniversary of the language. Yeah, I know, it's hard to believe that. To me, the introduction of Swift feels like it was just a couple years ago. I still remember that one more thing added to the variant of 2014's WWDC. We have a new programming language. But this video is not about reflecting on the past, nor is it about predicting the future. This time, I'd like to share a few thoughts on what I wish to see in Swift and the DevTools this year. I'll start with something small, and then go more ambitious. But before I do, I'm asking you to subscribe to the Swift Bird. It's a small channel, so each like and subscription makes a big impact. First and foremost, what I want to see improved in Swift this year is overall language consistency. Over the 10 years Swift's been out, it's become a very versatile tool, something like a Swiss Army knife. Even though most updates were publicly discussed, debated, and refined before their release, 10 years is still enough for some inconsistency to creep in. The Swift of today is a mix of the concepts implemented from the very beginning and the paradigms introduced along the way. I'm not gonna over dramatize and say Swift is no longer easy for beginners. It still is, mostly. But at the same time, Swift now has several things which can confuse even experienced developers. Here's one of them. It is something I see fairly often in all kinds of projects. A bunch of symbols meant to be used within just one class. They can be constants, utilities, formatters, and so on. Because they're not needed anywhere outside the class, it makes a lot of sense to mark them private. And in many cases, instead of putting the keyword before each symbol, they all are just enclosed in a single private extension. Except the symbols inside this extension are not private. In fact, they're file private. Had these symbols truly been private, I wouldn't have been able to reference them from a different object like this. Even when the object is within the same file. That's because the private mode is supposed to be stricter than file private. But in this scenario, that is not the case. You see, many years ago, Swift's access control modifiers used to behave slightly differently. Only in version 3 they became what they are today. This redesign, however, had certain side effects. One of them is this implicit transformation of private to file private. It was a compromise for backward compatibility. But this compromise remains even after 8 years since Swift 3 came out. I don't think every engineer must know about every caveat of the language. I don't even think knowing about them adds much value to the engineer's skill or experience. Well, I mean it does, but it really shouldn't. I believe the programming language, and technology in general, is merely a tool for solving real-world problems. And for most engineers, it's the reality. We work to create products that deliver value to the users not to impress someone with our textbook perfect code. Unless you are writing code snippets for textbooks, of course. This was only one example, but you can easily find many more. For instance, take the APIs of some built-in frameworks. Why do you have functions in some cases, but properties in others? And yeah, I know, these are separate frameworks and not Swift itself. But many of them were updated specifically for Swift, and there's no reason they cannot be made to look and behave even more natively. Even though Swift was made open source many years ago, Apple still retains huge leverage over the language evolution. It certainly can polish it a bit more and remove those artifacts of the past. To sum up, I believe the programming language should be helping the engineer by taking any complexity and confusion out of the process. And because of that, I'd love to see Swift finally say goodbye to the legacy caveats of the past. And now we're moving on to the more ambitious things. In the last couple of years, artificial intelligence has made a real breakthrough in many areas. You've most likely tried OpenAI's ChatGPT, Google's BART, or Microsoft's Copilot. And chances are you use them on a daily basis. I do it all the time, especially when I research something for the videos. But besides those general purpose chatbots, there's also a large number of specialized tools. For example, Google's Notebook LM managed to analyze and explain my own bachelor thesis even better than I remember it myself. And of course, AI tools have already made their way into software development. Perhaps the most widely used one is GitHub's Copilot, but it has very limited capabilities when it comes to Swift. So is Google's Bard, even though in my own experience it works slightly better with Swift. 
but even the best tools available today are still not good enough. That's because neither of them is tailored to the specific Swift code base you're working on. And none of them's been able to marry AI assistance with input from the actual Swift compiler. That is why you sometimes get the code which looks correct, but doesn't compile when you paste it in Xcode. And this is where Apple could do a lot. Just imagine Xcode not only giving you an empty template for tests, but also filling it with complete test methods. Moreover, imagine how much faster you could work if Xcode automatically amended any AI suggestions based on your actual module interface and test coverage percentage. But sadly, at this point, this feels like only a dream. Because come on, right now Xcode often struggles even with very simple tests, such as renaming symbols. Besides, Apple hasn't demonstrated any sort of advancement in artificial intelligence yet. And when it does, I bet it's gonna be focused on consumers, not developers. But anyways, this is just something I want to see in Xcode moving forward. It's not a prediction in any way. But if you do use AI tools in your coding work today, let me know in the comments. I'm very curious about your experience, how good they are. My own use of them is mostly limited to generating boilerplate, like writing setup code and tests. But even in this scenario, I often have to fix the generated code afterward. And more complex cases, such as refactoring large classes, so far turned out not even worth my time. Every time I tried, I ultimately ended up doing everything by myself. Just because sorting out the suggestions was much longer and much harder. And here comes my biggest wish for Swift this year. But it also was my biggest wish last year and the year before that. It's about Swift going beyond just Apple platforms. First and foremost, I'm talking about Swift on the server. As you perhaps know, there's nothing that prevents Swift from running on Windows or Linux, and even compiling for platforms like WebAssembly. But just the ability to compile and run the program is not enough to ensure any sort of traction for the language. Swift's been available on other platforms for many years, but its actual use outside the Apple ecosystem is pretty low. Honestly, I think that's unfair. Because all the features that make Swift so great on the iPhone could also benefit backend developers. Using the same stack could give many opportunities to the people developing client apps that interact with the backend, which is basically most developers and especially to the people developing client apps alongside their backend, uh, people like me. Right now, I mostly use TypeScript and Node for writing server-side code in my projects, and I cannot say I enjoy using them. With the status quo on Swift on the backend, it's just not worth the hassle for most engineers. And to me, that feels kind of sad, because there's a number of great projects that make using Swift on the server just as easy and enjoyable as on iOS and macOS. And more importantly, there's a fantastic community behind these projects. Last summer, I was in Apple's mentorship program, where I got a few great tips on using Swift on the backend. It wasn't the easiest thing to set up and use compared to developing client apps. So after having built a prototype of my own project, I switched to something else. But anyway, it gave me some insight into the overall process, and also the future plans of the community. No matter what Apple does to push the server initiative forward, and frankly, I doubt it's going to do much. My own goal for this year is to build a fully functional project that runs on a serverless platform, such as Firebase Functions. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in this topic. If you are, I'll be covering my progress on this channel, and probably open source the project in the end. In my understanding, Apple has little interest to invest its own resources into making Swift more widespread on the backend. But I guess it's time to stop relying on Apple after all. Before I wrap up, I'd like to mention a couple things that didn't make it to my wish list. I realized they could have a huge impact on the developer community, and as such they are wanted by many people. But I'm just not invested in them personally. The first thing is yet another aspect of using Swift beyond just Apple platforms. It's using the language to develop Android apps. A few years ago, I got some experience with the opposite approach, using Kotlin to write the common business logic for both iOS and Android. And let me tell you, it didn't go well. Though Kotlin Mutze Platform is a first-party initiative of JetBrains, the maintainer of Kotlin, even setting up the cross-platform workflow turned out to be a nightmare. My team and I focused just on the business logic and didn't touch the user interface whatsoever. But bugs and crashes were abundant anyways. Granted, many things could change in the two years since then. 
But so far, cross-platform app development still seems to mostly come down to using JavaScript frameworks like React Native. And in most cases, such apps don't feel native at all. Swift seems an unlikely candidate to become the cross-platform solution in the near future. That's because its maintainers are mostly focused on just the Apple platforms. And here comes one more thing related to cross-platform development in Swift. It is using the language as a front-end framework on the web. This is something rarely discussed. I guess that's because there's just so little overlap between app and website developers. But technically, with its excellent support for DSLs, Swift could really shine in building powerful websites. In addition to easy-to-read syntax, it also features built-in safety checks, so invalid code would just not compile. But again, I doubt we're gonna see much progress in this direction anytime soon. And now's the time for a wrap up. I explained some of the things I want to see in the next iterations of Swift. I intentionally did not limit myself to what Apple and the Swift steering board are likely to do. It's more like feedback from someone who's been using Swift for over six years. Of course, now I'm looking forward to your feedback. Tell me in the comments what you like and dislike about today's Swift. Do you agree with any of my points or do you have a different perspective? I guess it would be interesting to go back to this topic later this year and see what 2024 actually brings to Swift and its community. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the Swift Bird. It is something that really helps me grow this little channel. In the description, you will also find the links where you can support the Swift Bird by sponsoring it. Also, tell me what you think about this analysis genre. I've had a look at my last year's videos and noticed most of them were just explainers and tutorials. While they're good at answering specific questions, sometimes I feel restricted by the format. That's without even saying that researching and fact-checking every detail takes a lot of effort. I'm thinking of making the channel's content more diverse with videos like today's. I'd love to get your input on that. Next week, I'll be back with a video on one crucial piece in the software development process and how you can improve it in just a few minutes. Stay tuned and make your year fly!